that being said, do you have a Bible? Do you have a Bible? If you have a Bible, you have a real Bible, like, like leather bound. Wave it at me. Just wave it. I want to see where my real Christian's at so I can. This side is where I'm going to preach to mostly because y'all got, none of y'all got, we got three people with Bibles. My goodness. But Nell's got, you, Nell, Nell, is that pink? You got a pink? Hey. Hey, whatever, man. I, I know my identity. Good. 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 Grab your Bible. Grab your Bible. And turn to the last book in the Bible, Revelation. Oh. Oh. Ooh. Revelation, chapter 19. Close out this series. Same old love. I thought it would only be fitting if we closed out this message, closed out this, this thought by reading and preaching from the last book of the Bible. I really believe this, this text, it is a supernatural text. This is the holy word of God that was given to us to reveal to all of humankind God's plan and God's story of love and redemption. And what better place to talk about love? What better place to talk about that same old love that was there, that formed you, that created you, that knew you in your mother's womb? Than the last book of the Bible. So Revelations chapter 9, starting in verse 6. Are you there? If, you, if you're there, say there. Come on, we are a loud church. We preach with the preacher here. If I say something that you like, you can respond, you can shout, you can wave at me, you can, you know, throw, you know, wave a little hanky at me, a little towel. I grew up Southern Baptist, we had hankies, you know what I'm talking about? Just wave it. But respond with me. The louder that you respond, the faster and the better that I will preach. And so if you want to make it to Buffalo Wild Wings in time for those 60 cent traditional wings. I think that's what they have. I don't know. Preach with me. It's going to be a lot of fun. Are you there? Revelation chapter 19 says this. Then, this is John writing. John says, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder. I don't know what a peal of thunder is, but it's loud apparently. It's like a peal of an orange, but just thundery. Loud peals of thunder, peals, shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad. Underline that, highlight that. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride, underline that, his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8, this is important. We're going to spend a lot of time on this verse tonight. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. And then a little parentheses. Thank you, John, for giving us little footnotes. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Don't you wish the Bible came with more of those? Like, and when I say that, this is what I mean. This is what, <laughs> amen. Then the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. No big deal. You know, don't you wish you could just say that? Some of you do say that when you, you know, you're breaking up with your girl and you're like, God told me, he said, don't do that. Don't do that. That's free advice. Don't do that. It's not a good look. Just say, hey, it ain't working out. You don't know my favorite food. I don't know. It's not gonna work out. Keep moving. But <laughs> John says, and these are the true words of God. <laughs> Let's pray tonight. It's going to be a fun night. I can tell it's going to be a rowdy night tonight. I'm believing that we're going to laugh a lot and God's going to speak to us a lot. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you tonight. We worship you in this place. We thank you, Lord, for your love that reaches further than the sun. It, it finds us in our deepest, darkest places, and it brings us into your marvelous light. Lord, I pray tonight as we study your word, as we gather together, that you would speak to us. We know you're here. Your, your word says where two or more are gathered there, you are with them also. We know you're here tonight. And wherever your spirit is, wherever your presence is, it changes lives. It sets people free. It heals the broken heart. And we're believing for that tonight. Speak to us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, everyone at the rendezvous said. Amen. Everyone at the rendezvous said. Amen. Come on, can we thank Sarah one time on the keys? Just... I love, um, I love weddings, right? That's, that's the scene that we're talking about. The, the picture that John is, is painting for us is, is a scene of, it's a wedding. And I'm coming up in a few, few weeks here. I know you're 
not sure based on the, the results of our dating game, but um, Holly and I are coming up on two years of marriage. On March 7th, we'll be married two years. Come on, yeah, you can give it up for monogamy tonight. <laughs> Shout out to monogamy. I love, I love being married, and one of my favorite memories you know, was our wedding. I, I, I love, I'll be honest, I, I think my wedding, I've been to a couple weddings, and my, my wedding was the best. It was the baddest. It was so cool. We got married on the water in Seattle. Holly had it timed out so that as we're overlooking the water that our, of, our, of, our, of our room that we're getting married in, as it overlooks the water, the sun is setting over the mountains at just at the same time. And so there's a beautiful sunset as we're standing there and doing our vows. And it's just a beautiful, it was amazing. And if you've never been to Seattle, Seattle has the worst weather on the planet like for like 11 months out of the year. And then there's like one month where it's gorgeous. But the month that we got married wasn't one of those months. And so the few days before, it was rainy and gross and nasty. And the few days after, it was rainy and gross and nasty. But, but on our day, <laughs> on our day, the clouds parted and the sun was shining and doves were flying through the air. And you could see Mount Rainier in the distance. And it was a beautiful day. It was just an amazing day. It was, we, were, we were saying it was a Hepler wedding miracle that the sun was shining. And I love our wedding. We, we, had a, we had a videographer. I would encourage you, if you're not getting married, if you've, you're not married yet and you're going to get married, uh, you want to invest a lot of money in a good videographer because you're going to want to look back because it happens so quick, you forget it all because you're just thinking about like after the wedding, fellas, where you <laughs> And then you, you need to have a video to remind you what all happened that day. You're watching the video like, oh my God, I said that. Oh my God. Why was I? I'm just telling you. And so I love, we have this great wedding video, and, and I love, I love our wedding. I like to watch it. Like, I'll watch it once or twice a week. I'll just start crying, watching it. I'm emotional. I know, uh, I know. I live in that fine line between, like, he cries a lot, and he, he should be committed to, like, a mental institution. Like, I'm just right in there. It's like, oh, he's emotional. Or, ah, ah, he should be in a straight jacket. I don't know. But I just love to watch our wedding. And my, one of my favorite one of our fa my favorite things that we did is actually one of the things that we got in a fight over as we were planning was Holly asked me, she said, do you want to, the first time you want to see me, do you want it to be like, as I'm walking down the aisle or do you want to do a first look? And I said, I don't know. I just, I guess I always just imagine be the first time, you know, I see you is when you come down the aisle. And she said, okay, well, too bad. We're doing a first look. And I said, okay, why'd you even ask? I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. Years later, we're going to do a relationship game. I'm gonna, this is going to happen again, babe. I'm just going to apologize in advance. I'm going to get the wrong answer. <laughs> so we did, we did what's called a first look. And so before our wedding, we, we gathered on the pier in Seattle. And, and we, we, she, I stood there on the water, and she came up and you know, tapped me on the shoulder. I saw her, and we did all our wedding pictures beforehand, which is so great if you're a guest at a wedding because there's nothing worse than when you're waiting for two and a half hours for the bridal party to get finished with their pictures so you can eat your food. You, you want to just help them out. So we took all our pictures on the front end so we could go right from our wedding to our reception, right? And so as I'm sitting, but I'll never forget this, as I'm sitting, as I was sitting in the car, waiting so it was the person driving the vehicle our wedding planner and my, my my best man darnell my best friend in all the world he's sitting there and we're talking and i'm like i'm i'm nervous i'll be honest i was nervous i was trying to act like i had it together but my palms when i get nervous my palms get real sweaty that's why I'd like before service i'm always like fist bumping it because i my palms get sweaty and i'm just like and it, my, my sometimes when i get nervous i talk like a little too loud like you know when you just overshoot on the volume sometimes i'm sitting there i'm like nice weather huh like, Joe, we're all, we're all right here. We're, we're sorry, I just get nervous. When I get nervous, I shout a little bit. I'm sorry. Low weather, it's nice, huh? Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop talking now. Still all here, Joe. Still right here. I was so nervous, right? Because I just couldn't wait to see my bride. I couldn't wait to see her in her dress. And so I was sitting, I was so, so anxious, so, so excited. I asked our wedding planner who had been with Holly, that morning as she was getting ready, I said, you know, Mom, Jill, you know, how's, how's Holly doing? How's she doing? Is she, is she doing good? How, how's she look? How's she look? And I'll never forget. She said, oh, Joe, Holly, Holly was born a bride. She was, she was born a bride. When you see her in her dress, 
you'll know that she was created for this moment to wear that dress, to look how she does. She looks so stunning, elegant, beautiful. She was born a bride. Tonight, if if you're taking notes, just a few brief moments that we have, I encourage you to take some notes, write this down. Uh, I want to talk just from the subject, born a bride. Write that on your notes, type that in your smartphone, born a bride. And, and I love the picture that we have that John gives us. You know, you ever have people say, I wonder what heaven's going to be like? You ever, you ever have that conversation? I wonder what heaven's going to be like. People talk about streets of gold and like lakes of glass and all sorts of stuff. And, and we're really just nothing that we could come up with in our human minds ever quite gets at what heaven really is going to be like. But, but John, John, John tries to put it into human words, what it will be like when we see Christ Jesus in all his glory and, and death is, is finally defeated and we are with King Jesus once and for all. And, and I love it because the picture that he paints us is, is a wedding. It's a wedding. It's the wedding between the lamb, the bridegroom, Jesus, and his bride. The church, the holy people, you and I, the Bible says, are the bride of Christ. This is why I think as the conversation of marriage and the sanctity of marriage goes on in our, our nation, in our world, this is so important beyond, beyond little texts, beyond little scripture verses. This, this is the central theme of what God says his whole story is about. It culminates in the marriage of the bride and the groom. This is such an important picture. Marriage, it's not, don't get it twisted. It's not just the, a societal construct that was created to promote families and, and societal growth. It, it wasn't just a man-made institution. When you see this, what, what John's trying to get us to get, what he's trying to get us to see is that the covenant, the bond between a bride and a groom, when you partake in that, that is a heavenly moment. It's a spiritual moment. It's a holy moment. Because when a bride is wedded together with a groom, they point towards eternity. They point towards God's purpose and plan for all of creation between a bride and a groom. Notice it doesn't say, fellas, a groom and a bride and a side piece and a side side piece. It's one groom, Jesus with one bride, his church. This is the picture that we have. This is so important as we discuss marriage, why we have series on relationships and dating and how to have a healthy marriage. It's so important because you, when you gather together, when you join in a covenant of love, you're pointing towards eternity. It's so important. And I love it though, because this is not, this is not some somber solemn wedding where you're just sitting there and they have the vows and then they quietly exit and people say, well, fantastic, this is great, fantastic. Oh, beautiful dress, fantastic, okay. Let us leave. No, 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 do you, do you see what it says? It says, he heard a sound like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder. Do you understand? At this scene, at this wedding scene, it's a party. In heaven, in eternity, when the bride and the groom, when we meet Jesus, yeah. friends, it's going to be a party. Yeah. So you may be here, you, you, this may be your first time at church, first time at the rendezvous, and you're wondering why we have bass drops in our worship. You're wondering why we have all this sort of music, why everyone's dancing and singing, why we're having such a good time. Just because we caught a bit of a revelation of what it's going to look like in eternity. And if we're going to be partying and praising in eternity, we might as well start practicing right now. Now, I don't know. I don't know what sort of weddings that you've been to. But my wedding, after we said I do and we cut the cake, friends, we had a party. I think, actually, we have a, a clip from my wedding video just to give you an idea of what the turnip was like. Do, do we have that? She would have put that cake on my face. I would have just walked out. Shield your eyes, children. Hear the beautiful music. Doesn't she look great? Come on, let's give it up for Holly one time. Looking beautiful. 
And then, and then you're going to notice here that things are about to drastically change in just a moment. fun happening that's my boy Pablo he's probably saying something wild there there you go you see so it, it was a turn up at the Hebler wedding now I'm sorry if y'all weren't there I'm sorry if you got invited to people's weddings they don't know how to have a little bit of fun but at our wedding we turned up a bit and at the wedding between Christ Jesus and the church it says let us rejoice and be glad let us sing songs of praise let us dance a little bit. Let's dab on the devil. I'm just saying. I think it's so funny that he says, let us rejoice and be glad. When I look around, and I see so many Christians that are upset and bitter and angry. I don't think there's really such thing as an angry Christian. That doesn't, that's an oxymoron. That, doesn't, that should not exist. I think more often than not, when the world looks at you and I, what the world sees is, is more of a bridezilla than a bride. When the world looks at the church, you, they, see a, they don't see the bride of Christ. They, they see the bridezilla. You ever met a bridezilla? You ever been in a wedding with a bridezilla? Don't raise your hand. She may be here with you. <laughs> Did she hurt you? Did she hurt you? Then <laughs> bridezilla, you know, they think just because they're the bride, they can say whatever they want. They can talk down to people. They can order people around. They can judge people. I think when the world looks at the church, when the world looks at Christians, far too many times it sees a bunch of bridezillas that, that think just because they're the bride, they can judge other people, they can talk down to other people, they can order people around, say, you're wrong, you don't know what you're talking about. I think a lot more people would want to enter into a relationship with Jesus if, if they encountered the bride of Christ, loving and full of grace, and not the bridezilla, full of judgment, condemnation. I'm just saying, let us rejoice and be glad. And then I love verse 8. Like I said, it says fine linen. Fine linen. She was clothed. The bride is this picture. That the bride is clothed in this fine linen. And it stands, he says, the clothing represents the actions of the righteous people. John makes this connection between the clothing and the actions that it represents. This is so significant. This is where I really want to unfold this tonight for us. Is that the clothing of the bride is so important. Wow, you said, what do you mean? Have you ever been at a restaurant or you ever been out in public and then all of a sudden you see a man dressed in a suit yeah. with a woman in a big white dress? Have you ever seen that happen? And then the first thing you think is, oh, there's, there's a wedding. There's a bride and a groom, right? And now imagine if you saw the same man dressed in the same suit with the same woman, but she was dressed in some like red bottom heels with a skimpy little skirt and Stomach showing and hair. same man, same suit, same woman, different dress. You, you wouldn't say, oh, look, there's a wedding. You'd say, honey, look away. It's shield the kids. Like, I don't know what's about to happen. Oh, my gosh. I don't know what this is. Why? Because the clothing that the bride wears corresponds to the actions. The clothing testifies to who the bride is, and the bride testifies to who the groom is. You and I, as the bride of Christ, the way we act, the way that we uh, put our clothes on, so to speak, testifies to who our groom is. You and I, as the bride of Christ, 
When the, the world looks at us, when people look at us, they should say, that's the bride. And I know if that's the bride, I know who the groom is. Yeah. It's so important. Think, think about it. I just want to talk, clothing. The clothing that you wear. I'm talking externally, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about internally. But externally, the clothing you wear is so important. Clothing, it communicates so much to the, what people think about you, communicates about what you do. Think, for example, think for example, if you're walking down in Wynwood, got your, your Panther coffee, and you're walking around looking at the walls, and then you, you, see, you see a person getting attacked in an alleyway, and you freak out. Oh, my gosh. Ah, oh, my gosh. Ah, that person's getting attacked. Ah, what do I do? Ah, and then you, then you see down the way you see a person dressed in a police officer's uniform. You think, oh, thank Jesus. Okay, fantastic. And you, you run and say, oh, thank you. So glad you're here, officer. Fantastic. I saw you there. And there's a person back over here. I, I'm going to keep talking, but we should really hurry. We should make our way this way. We can walk and talk. If we can walk and talk, because there's a person, and you're a police officer, so could you help? Could you help perform the duties of a police officer and save this person? Imagine how surprised and perplexed you would be if the person wearing the police officer's uniform said, oh, oh, oh I'm... <laughs> this is kind of embarrassing. It's a bit awkward. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm not a police officer. I, I'm just wearing the uniform. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just wearing the uniform. I, I'm really just an, an IT guy at Best Buy. I, uh, you would be very confused because the uniform often dictates the actions that you'll perform. You want to get really practical tonight. Ladies, what uniform are you wearing? And what does it communicate about the actions that you perform? Fellas. What are you clothing yourself with? What is your attire? What is your uniform? Communicate about the actions and the duties that you perform. What does it say? Does it say that you operate with integrity and honor and respect? What does it say? Because it's so important. You can ju be judged so often by your external appearance. I, I remember, <laughs> what, uh, have you ever been profiled? Chino, don't raise your hand. We know. Stop it. Put your hand out. See, I got you. Ha! I knew it. One time, I got profiled. I know you're saying, how did you get profiled? I got profiled. Listen. I was in college, and I didn't always, this is, uh, this is post, this is before Holly, this is before she came into my life and cleaned me up and made me respectable. This is pre-Holly, and I looked kind of borderline homeless, and so one day, me and my boys went in my truck to get Taco Bell, because we were college students, and we were broke, and that's all we could afford, and uh, we go and get Taco Bell, and the road, that we, we were heading back to our apartment, the road you had to turn on, you have to turn it's a light, you have to turn left, right? And so I'm there, the light turns green, there's a car that needs to turn right, but I'm like, not today car, I gotta eat my Taco Bell, cheese gonna eat a crunch. And so I cut in front of him, turn left, when I was supposed to let him turn right first, I turn left, and right when I do that, whoop, I, ah, it was this red car, it was an unmarked undercover police officer. I'm like, officer, if you would've been a police car, I wouldn't cut you off, like, come on. You made me do this. I didn't want to. That's not fair. That's cheating. <laughs> Pulls me over. And look, at this point in the story, I should tell you that uh, my 1998 Ford Explorer had no air conditioning, had 300,000 miles in it, so it barely was running. And it was, night, it was the heat of summer in Lakeland, Florida, and so I was not wearing a shirt. My homie Darnell was in a, was in a tank top and socks and slides. And my, two, my boy Pablo in the back looked borderline homeless. My boy Steven looked borderline homeless. We just, we were a mess. None of us had girlfriends. None of us had wives. We were a mess. No one to take care of us, tell us how to dress right, wipe the spit off our faces. You know what I'm saying? And so the guy pulls, he comes over and he goes, son, do you know what you did? I said, let's share. Let's talk about it. I don't know. What do you think I did? Because I'm not trying to tell him myself. Like, I'm not trying to give you more than I should. He says, son, do you know that a car turning right on green has precedent over a car turning left on green? Do you know that you couldn't do that 
Did you know that it was illegal? And I looked at him, my boy Darnell was looking at me like, man, I cannot get locked up. This is not cool. Don't say anything stupid, Joe. And I go, this, I promise you, this is what I said. <laughs> I go, I'm sorry, officer. I didn't know I couldn't do that. And my boy Darnell looks at me like, that's the best you can say. That's the best you can come up with. He's going to have us on the curb. And he goes, okay, well, um, fair enough. Fine, fair enough. And my boy Darnell's like, what? That would not have worked for me. What are you talking about? I didn't know I couldn't do that. I, uh, I didn't like, he goes, fine, okay, fine. I need license and registration. And he goes, and then he goes, this is so great. He goes, and he's looking. Now, just imagine all the windows down, because there's no AC in the car, a bunch of homeless looking college dudes with like six bags of Taco Bell. You tell me what you think we look like we're up to. If you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know, ask somebody who's got a past. Um, and so he goes, now, boys, neither one of you have been smoking pot, have you? Uh, no, sir. No, 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 not at all. No, no, no. Okay. You sure? I'm sure. Pop, 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 positive. We're just hungry. Uh, that's it. Just, just hungry. So he goes, he goes back to the car. He's like, I'm going to check this license registration. Checks it. Comes back. He goes, fine. Everything checks out. And he goes, now, boys, you sure none of you are smoking weed? Like as if he changed it from the word weed to pot, he was going to catch us, like trip us up. <laughs> no, sir, we haven't, we haven't been smoking. He goes, I kid you not, you can't make this up. He goes, so you mean to tell me if I were to search this car right now, I wouldn't find any marijuana in the car? <laughs> no, you wouldn't find any marijuana in the car. No pot, weed, marijuana, nothing. You can keep changing the words, same answer. And at that point, like, I started, like, saying unnecessary information. I'm like, I'm 20, and I'm going to Southeastern, and I'm getting my, master, my bachelor's degree, and, and he's going to get his worship leader's degree. And, and I'm telling, like, all of our, he's got a brother and a sister, and we wouldn't smoke pot. <laughs> Officer. I don't want to tell you. And he goes, he goes, he goes, okay, fine. Sure enough, he lets us, lets us go, gives us a warning. We go, and we eat our ice-cold Taco Bell. And, it's a, it's a funny story, but, but the truth of the matter is, is that regardless of who we were, the way that we looked indicated to the officer that the activities we might be doing may pertain to people that looked the way that we did. I'm just saying. You might be saying, oh, Joe, that's, hey, don't you know that you can't judge a book by its cover? Sure, but the Bible says I can judge a tree by, I tell a tree by its fruit, and uh, homie, I see way too much of your fruit in my life. I just need you to keep on, you know what I'm saying, like, uh, you just need to pull your pants up. I don't need, just, I don't need to see. I don't need to see it. You can tell a tree by its fruit. I'm just saying, your clothing so often indicates the actions that you participate in. Clothing also indicates identity, who you are. A doctor is going to be wearing a doctor's uniform. Why? Because that's who they are. A basketball player is going to be wearing a basketball uniform because that's who they are. You never are going to go to the AAA and you're never going to see like Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh in tutus. Why? Because they're not ballerinas. It's because their identity isn't a ballerina. They're not going to be wearing the clothes of a ballerina. Why? Because identity often dictates the things that you will put on and the things that you will allow people to hand you to put on. You won't receive if you know who you are. The, but the problem is, the problem is, is that so many young people don't know their identity, don't know who they are, don't know whose they are. So therefore, they'll walk around through this life and they'll take whatever the world hands them. They'll take whatever lie, whatever label, whatever falsehood, and they'll just take it and they'll, they'll put it on. Say, I don't know who I am, so I, I guess I'll... I guess I'll look this way. I guess I'll talk this way. I guess I'll act this way. I, I don't, just don't know who I am. I was listening. Um, I, was, I was in the car, and this ad came on on the radio, and the, the band can come up. I preached too long already. The band can come up. I, I heard this ad. It was for the clothing store Old Navy. Anyone shop at Old Navy? The three white people. <laughs> Tucker, Jeremy, and Courtney. I'm glad to see you at church today. Glad you can. I'm just kidding, white people. I, I love white people. Matter of fact, some of my best friends are white. So there you go. I'm 
All the white people are like, I shop at Aeropostale. How dare you? <laughs> so I heard this. <laughs> so I heard this. <laughs> I'm so sorry if you're wearing Old Navy. Like, Jesus, still, like, like you can still be used for the gospel. I promise. <laughs> I'm sure I have an Old Navy shirt in my closet from seventh grade. Stop it. It's fine. <laughs> But I was listening to this ad, and the, adver- the advertisement on the radio was for Old Navy. They were advertising these new jeans that they're selling, right? And they're saying, if you come into the store and you'll try on a pair of our new jeans, we'll give you $5 off your purchase just to try them on. Charles was like, my goodness, I never shopped at Old Navy, but that's a good deal. <laughs> just to try it on. You don't even have to buy the jeans. They say, you... You can just take $5 off your purchase. Why? Because the smart people at Old Navy know that studies show that if a sales associate can just get you to take the clothes off the rack and get it in your hands, the chances that you'll walk out and buy it increase dramatically. They also know that if they can get you to try on that clothing, that the chances that you'll buy it increase exponentially just that they can get you to try it on if they can get you to try it they can get you to buy it buy into it i think the enemy of your soul knows this about your identity and so many of you you had a god dream like we were talking about earlier god called you god spoke an identity over you and then the enemy The devil came at you with the first temptation. He said, did did he really say that? Like Eve in the garden, did, did he really say that you were called? Did he really say that you were a son and daughter of the king? Did he really say it? How about, how about you try this on instead? And if he can just get you to try it on, if he can just get you to buy into what the world wants to label you with, if he can just get you to try it on. So many of you have tried on some things that the world has spoken over you. Maybe, maybe someone told you that you were a mistake. And so you tried it on and you bought in. And you've walked through life wearing mistake as your identity, wearing mistake as your attire, not just externally, but internally. Maybe someone told you that you were worthless. So you tried that on. Sure enough, you bought into it. And you've walked around this world buying into the lie that you're worthless, that someone threw on you, that someone placed on you. Maybe someone told you that you're just an object of sexual pleasure for another person. And you tried that on. You didn't want to. Before you knew it, you bought into it. And that became this this false identity that you were never meant to walk through life with. That you were never meant to carry. But you tried it, so you you bought into it. I want to talk, just closing, this is is my last thought. We're going to sing some songs. People are going to meet Jesus. It's going to be fantastic. I want to talk to the ladies tonight. Fellas, just shut up and listen. This is going to help you too. Ladies, so many of you have tried on and bought in to the lie that you were created, you were born as an object for a man's pleasure to be used and then discarded. So many of you tried that on, have bought into it. And it really, it, it affects so many young women and so many young men, but I, I feel like I was sitting here tonight to, to talk to one people group in particular, because I believe that there is no more objectified, denigrated, and degraded demographic in our society than that of the black female. Somewhere along the way, it became okay in our society 
to put down and abuse and mistreat black women in this country and all over the world. You don't believe me? Read the statistics. Look at social media. Check out World Star, where young black girls are being abused and mistreated as people watch and laugh. Look at the statistics on teen pregnancy and poverty that are astronomical and that are ravaging this demographic. And it is so pervasive and so deeply rooted within our culture and society. Did you know, there's my last story, I promise I'm, I'm, I'm done with this. I just, someone needs to hear this tonight. Back in 1850, in Missouri, there was a girl named Celia. She was 14 years old. She's a 14-year-old black girl, and at age 14, she was bought at a slave auction by a white slave owner. From the age 14 to 19, for five years of her life, she was raped repeatedly, daily, by this man. She bore two of his children against her will. Finally, in 1855, you can research this, Celia versus Missouri, a very famous court case. 1855, one night, when the man comes in to abuse her, she had hidden a, a large wooden stick by her, by her bed, and as he comes in, she takes the stick and hits him over the head with it multiple times, ultimately killing him. <laughs> and then, Celia is tried for the murder of her slave owner, the man who had been abusing her sexually for five years. And her defense attorney pleads and says, this was self-defense. She was being raped in the state of Missouri. It's unlawful for a man to force a woman to have sexual relations. These are her rights. And you know what happened? Missouri, the Missouri court ruled against Celia on the basis that that law did not apply to her because she was not a person. She was an object. She was property. And as property, she therefore had no right. And from that point on, that was a sign. That verdict was a sign by the way she was hanged as a result of her crime for simply resisting her attacker. At that point, that was a, a sign to everyone that black women in America, they, they weren't people, they were objects to be treated however you wanted. That's something that has pervaded our culture to today. It's a great ill of our country that we must call out and address. And I wish there were some young men, some men of God that would stand up for some of their sisters and say, not on my watch. Not while I'm still living. Not while I'm still breathing. This is my sister. I'm here to tell someone tonight Regardless of creed, gender, class, color, I'm here to tell you tonight that you are not an object. You are the object of his affection. You were not born to be the object for someone else to use and abuse and discard. You were born a bride. You have been destined for greatness. You have been called according to his purpose. And there will be a day where he's going to clothe you in strength, clothe you in dignity, clothe you in grace. And you're going to be able to stand before him and say, your love reaches further than the sun. It carries me when I am lost. I'm not an object. I'm an object of your affection. I'm a bride. Come on, old across this place. If you believe it tonight, let's lift our hands. Let's lift our voice.